afternoon and or morning, depending on which side of the world you live on. Today is the 6th of January, 2020. It is a Tuesday. I'm Brock Jennings. And I'm Peter Clark, and it's actually a Monday. It is? Yes. Oh! <laughs> Do you want me to redo it? No, it's fine. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's really Monday today? It's really Monday today. <laughs> wow, my, my, my brain isn't working, apparently. It So my cold came Friday night. And uh, I thought it was getting better. Well, of course, I went out and I had a nice Cuban cigar this afternoon with a dear friend of mine who uh, whose family gave it to me for Christmas. And uh, now I'm starting to think to myself, what were you thinking? You have a cold and you smoked a cigar? <laughs> Whatever. Live your life. Wow. That's Epicureanism if I've ever heard it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, anyway, actually, our very first podcast that we did uh, four years ago, uh, we both were sick. Yes. I think. I think that sounds right. Yeah, or or you were sick to start with, and then I got sick the next day. Something happened. We were both sick. Mm-hmm. So we've done this show a lot uh, when one of us is ill. Somehow we always manage it. Yes, somehow we do. <clears throat> so you'll just have to put up with me being the one who sounds like not so great at the moment. Oh, that's fine. So, Peter, welcome to a new decade. Mm-hmm. A new decade, of course, of theological inquiry, right? Yes. High, high academic work. For you. <laughs> oh, you saw what I was trying to do there, didn't you? Mm-hmm. You're not. I'm not. You're not roping me into one of those fancy degrees. <laughs> Fancy degrees. I don't think of myself as getting a fancy degree, actually. No, it's not that fancy. It's just not in the cards for me right now. I know. Well, and we're here together virtually in the new year. It has officially been over two years since we have seen one another in person. It, it, has it really? Wow. Yep. It's been almost a year since we moved into this apartment. Has it been that long? Yeah, we just renewed our lease. Wow. I know, it's exciting. It's the first lease we've renewed since 2016. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you feel like an adult? Well, I feel like maybe there's some stability creeping into our lives, finally. Oh, God, what's that? I know, right? I, I don't know what stability means since I decided to pack my whole... <clears throat> Everything I owned up, throw most of it away except my books and, and a few knickknacks and move across the world. Yeah, I remember when I went off to college, I fit everything I needed in the back of a station wagon. Now it takes me the better part of a semi-truck. A whole semi-truck? No, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but one of those big moving trucks. Yeah, well, less is more, right? Yeah, but with three people... More is more. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that's what I wasn't considering. <coughs> Got three people and a dog to move. I somehow have to move two cats over here, but I'm not sure when or how or where I can do that. You'll figure it out. You have so much confidence in me. I do. You were a capable adult. I'm a what? A capable adult. <laughs> if you say so. I do. Some days I wonder. Well. And let's talk about the news, Peter. What there about the news? A... There's lots of news since we were last oh. on. Oh, there's lots of news. You know, there's a quote. He didn't actually say it as far as I know, but there's a quote attributed to Karl Barth that the, uh, I guess he was talking about the pastor, but I'll say the pastor, the theologian, the one interested in theological inquiry, should have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Yes, so, first of all, what newspapers do you read? Me? I uh, read mostly online news. Um, I read The Atlantic online. I oh. read some New York Times online. Various various sources, a lot of BBC. <coughs> do you subscribe to any of those? Like, financially? Yeah. I used to subscribe financially to The Atlantic. 
but times got tight. That'll probably be the first one to come back after Kate gets a raise. <laughs> I love it. Kate gets a raise and you resubscribe to the Atlantic. Not, yeah. not, to, not the Economist? No, no, I like the I like the balance of topics of the Atlantic. I I really like the Atlantic as a magazine. Okay. You know. And the New York Times, do you read that every day or No, it's just a a place that I go to if I see a story and I want to check it. It's one of the places I trust to check. Well, uh I I am still a subscriber to the New York Times. I get the educational discount, so I'm a digital subscriber. Oh, cool. To them. And uh, I've been going every day to the Times. I don't know if you remember this, but when I was in Minnesota, I used to subscribe to the hard copy newspaper. Yes. And I miss that. I would get up at 6 in the morning and the Times would be in my in my apartment, <clears throat> uh, in my mailbox room in the apartment. Oh, there's nothing like a newspaper, a real newspaper and a cup of coffee, Peter. I I believe it. I don't have time for those luxuries in the morning anymore. You will one day. Someday. Someday I will, and I'll get back to it. And it'll probably be a cup of coffee, the newspaper, and the pipe. I was I was totally envisioning this, the cup of coffee, the newspaper, and the pipe. But wait, Kate's going to let you smoke inside? No, no, just when it's nice out, sit out on the porch or the patio or something. Uh, I think for me it would be a cigar, but you know, that really is my favorite thing. I know. I'm I'm I, I'm much more I'm much more drawn to the aesthetic of the pipe. I do enjoy a cigar from time to time. I have a humidor, about a third full of cigars right now. But from time to time, Peter, we used to go all the time and smoke cigars together, not pipes. I know. But since I've gotten pi- cigars are so much more cigars are what people smoked at seminary and they were much more a part of, you know, what everyone I'm I'm a very social cigar smoker. Oh. When I'm smoking by myself, I tend to prefer a pipe. Though I will smoke, I, I will smoke a cigar if I'm fishing. It's easier to handle. But I, that's so interesting that you <coughs> prefer the pipe to the cigar. Because mm-hmm. I'm just the opposite. Probably for the same reasons too. I, I I actually enjoy the extra effort that a pipe takes. Okay, yes, it's an extra effort, but the tobacco isn't as strong. No. Um, it's not. It's mostly a contemplative exercise for me. In fact, I, I keep I keep pipes on my desk that I sometimes just sort of dry smoke. Just really? sort of puff on them with nothing in them. Huh. Well, it, it, what I mean by the strength of the tobacco, I'm really talking about the strength of the, of the taste. No, I know. Um, pipes are a much I... milder taste than cigars. Well, generally, you can get some pretty strong tasting pipe tobacco. I've got some three nuns staring at me that's have got a pretty solid body to it. And some somewhere around here, I have some English blend that's very, very potent. But it'll still never have the potency of a cigar. No. And part of, a large part of that's just because of the volume. Of, uh, you're going to smoke less in a pipe. Now, now that Peter is giving our listeners an overview, Uberblick in the German, of <laughs> what? Uh, uh, of of what the pipe versus what the cigar smoking experience is. <clears throat> I'm amused. But, you know, I tried cigarettes for a while up in Minnesota as well. I know, I even I, bought you a little, a little case for them. Yeah, you did. Well, you wanted me to roll them. Yes, actually, well, if but... you're going to smoke cigarettes, you ought to roll them. Well, actually, my, my, uh, my best friend over here who, uh, who smokes cigarettes rolls them and, uh, I've never just gotten it down. I've, I've never, I've never been able to do it. You can buy machines to help you. I know that's what you told me the first time, but of course, I, uh, I gave up smoking the cigarettes because two things. Number one, I, I'm smoking them like cigars, right? <laughs> Which and, really just uh, powers through them. I mean, it just like annihilates them. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's like that means... three puffs. No, oh, that was fun while it lasted. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. And that's actually what happened to me this afternoon, because after we smoked this, the, the the cigars, uh, I had a, I had a cigarette with my friend, who, and of course, you know, he rolled it for me, and he was, he was <laughs> sort of delighted that I was going to try this thing. And uh, lo and behold, it didn't take me long, and I was done with the thing. Yep. <laughs> and so I didn't inhale them in, in Minnesota, but then, 
Peter. The second reason I stopped was, well, one morning I decided to start inhaling them. Oh, uh. And, oh, it was a nice feeling. I sat out on the, uh, uh, one of the patios in, in my apartment complex where I used to live and uh, smoked my two cigarettes in the morning and my gigantic cup of coffee. And uh, I contemplated the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And, you know, bones or no bones, couldn't resist. And uh, then I got to the point where, you know, I wanted to contemplate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, bones or no bones, at noon. And then I wanted to contemplate it again at 2 o'clock. Mm-hmm. They're very addictive. And then, lo and behold, at 5 o'clock, I said, well, hell, if I began the day contemplating the resurrection of my Lord and Savior with a nice cigarette, perhaps I should end the day with it. And then I said, oh, this is a problem. <laughs> Nicotine is a fickle mistress. <laughs> so I stopped, and uh, I, I don't inhale. Yeah. <laughs> For obvious reasons. Yes. But uh, it really was. It was a fun five or six weeks. So anyway, after after uh, after this, I uh, uh, I stopped smoking. And then I got to the point where if I was with a friend and the friend smoked, because for some reason I have a lot of friends who smoke, even though I myself don't very much, I'd have a cigarette with him, but I wouldn't inhale. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, what I did today. So I'm back to my old habit. Well, go. Peter, I inhaled once. <clears throat> but I didn't like it. There you go. <laughs> it sounds like we're talking about marijuana, not about cigarettes. Right? I don't know what this has to do with the news. <laughs> you were reading the news with a cigar or something, or I was oh, no, reading the news with a pipe. <clears throat> that's your thing. Yeah. You, you would read the news in the morning with a pipe. Yep. Not sure which so one. I've got four solid choices right now. Of newspapers or pipes? Of pipes. So let's let's talk about what's going on in the world and how we might think about that theologically. Okay. And what I mean by by what's going on in the world, particularly this chaos around Iran, which mm -hmm. I am uh, I'm a mess about. Uh, you you saw the meme going around Facebook. It's a map. <laughs> Of Florida, and it says, Dear Iran. Oh, God, yes, I've seen that. At the golf course. <laughs> uh, I shared that on my it's, personal Facebook page. It's, it's funny, but I find it somewhat inappropriate. Why? Well, <clears throat> because it's encouraging violence. I mean, <laughs> excuse my lack of ethics, but compared to... Compared to the threat that this man is giving, I think that's a pretty mild response. Fair. I don't know. I just, I, uh, I still have such strong memories surrounding uh, being a protester for the Iraq war under Bush and stuff like that. I didn't realize you protested the Iraq war. Yeah. Well, and was this a good bonding experience with fellow protesters and fellow radicals? For the most part. It was a formative experience in my opinions on civil disobedience and things like that. It took you until 27 minutes and 57 seconds before you said things like that. Into our Just. phone call, not into the recording. I know, into our phone call. We always take a little time to, uh, what's the term? Um, Shoot the breeze? Yes. <laughs> That's the polite way of saying it? That's the it? polite way of putting it. Chew the fat. <laughs> um, but what do we say as Lutheran Christians when the government from a two kingdoms theology is a gift of God and is good right order in society prevents you from killing each other mm -hmm. well I think we pray for our leaders yes I think we pray for wisdom in our leaders I also think that we get out there and we make our voices heard. Yes. I think protest is not an inappropriate choice. Uh, obviously, different people have different priorities and things like that. I chose not to go to a protest this week because of my responsibilities as a father and as a husband. Um, but I strongly encourage younger people to get out and to get younger involved people. and to make your voices heard. 
I, I mean, encourage people of all ages, but especially younger people. I think it's important to learn these kinds of things when you're young, to have these kinds of experiences. We're getting old, Peter. We are getting old. So there's this little hitch in the Lutheran Confessions that I find very interesting. It's Article 16 of the Augsburg Confession. Mm-hmm. And it's and it, and the article is called in the Kolbwanger translation concerning public order and secular government. Mm-hmm. Page two hundred thirty one, I believe. Um, no, nope. page forty eight. Oh, I'm looking at the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Sorry. Yes, the Augsburg Confession. So, uh, do you want to just read? Do you want to just read Article 16 for us? Because I'm not in sufficient voice to read it. Wonderful. Concerning public order and secular government, it is taught that all political authority, orderly government, laws, and good order in the world are created and instituted by God, and that Christians may without sin exercise political authority, be princes and judges, pass sentences, and administer justice according to imperial and other existing laws, punish evildoers with the sword, wage just wars... Serve as soldiers, buy and sell, take required oaths, possess property, be married, etc. Condemned here are the Anabaptists, who teach that none of the things indicated above is Christian. Ah, the poor Anabaptists. You know, if you want to condemn somebody in the 16th century, it's always an Anabaptist. Anyway, sorry, keep going. It's just, like, get over it, guys. Anyway. Also condemned are those who teach that Christian perfection means physically leaving house and home, spouse and child, and refraining from the above-mentioned activities. In fact, Gee, that's kind of what I did. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> in fact, the only true perfection is true fear of God and true faith in God. For the gospel well, teaches an right? internal, eternal reality and righteousness of the heart, not an external, temporal one. Oh, okay. <laughs> so clearly, I have a dialectical relationship with this article. Right. Keep going. The gospel does not overthrow secular government, public order, no. and marriage but instead intends that a person keep all this as a true order of God and demonstrate in these walks of life Christian love and true good works according to each person's calling. Christians, therefore, are obliged to be subject to political authority and to obey its commands and laws in all that may be done without sin. But if a command of the political authority cannot be followed without sin, one must obey God rather than any human beings. And that little part redeems the whole article. As far as I'm concerned, it's the only important part of the whole article. (laughs) Uh, The rest of it is like, really? Really? Um, Well, this is a huge question. This has been a huge question throughout Christian history. I mean, whether or not Christians could serve as soldiers is a very old question in the Christian I would not serve as a soldier as a Christian. You would not. I would not, but can people faithfully serve as soldiers is a huge question. It's repeatedly been decided, yes, you can. I'm not sure I agree with that. I'm just telling you what the tradition says, not... I know what the tradition says. The tradition goes back to Augustine. Yep. I'm well aware. This notion of just war, I'm not convinced there is such a thing as a just war. So I'm going to contradict my little meme about Trump and on the golf course in Iran, but uh, that was shared ironically, obviously, not because yeah. I want somebody to blow the president up. God, no. <clears throat> no interest in that. But I I just... Well, do you think there is such a thing as a just war? Hmm. I think in some ways, I'm trying to think here, and I think the Civil War was very close to a just war, if not a just war. Oh, interesting. Especially after the Emancipation Proclamation. A fairly moderate document, but yes. And how about World War II? <clears throat> I would also say that is about as close to a just war as we've gotten. I think Luther would agree with the point I'm about to say, but you cannot ever wage war in the name of God. No, I, I don't. Not in the name of God. I think you can believe that God is on your side. Oh. In, in in fact, I th- I think it's an important part of, I mean, so so here's I mean, I've thought a lot about this and I'm very conflicted on this issue. So am I, for the record. And this is one of those things where I wish we were still recording at Luther, because I knew a number of people who were veterans at Luther, um, and who, or who were and or who were planning to go into the chap the military chaplaincy, would have I would have loved to have gotten their perspective on this. 
Yes, well, military chaplaincy, I think, is a very honorable uh, calling. And, you know, anybody who has served, I'm not going to demean or, or anything like that. No, I know. I'm just saying that our perspectives in particular are limited because neither of us have served. Neither no, of us have any intention of serving. No, I wouldn't. I would, uh, would, be a, I would be a conscientious objector, but it's hard to be a conscientious objector uh, because I'm a Lutheran. Yeah, I was um, not a Lutheran when I was a conscientious objector. What were you? Uh, I was various. <laughs> Um, mostly Episcopalian. Yeah, so the Episcopalians, that would be difficult because, or or maybe it would be easier, rather. It's difficult in the sense that there's not the specific confessional heritage, right? If Right. I have the sense that if you and I, as Lutherans, uh, if Trump reinscribes the draft, let's say. Well, which we're both out of the age range for. Really? Yeah. Well, you don't think he can make people in their 30s go off and serve for the fatherland? The age range for selective service is 18 to 25. Oh, God, I dunk in my case. But let's say you and I were in our 20s. Which I was when the Iraq War happened. But Bush wasn't going to reinstate the draft. Mm, there was There was some concern about it there for a minute. Really? Well, because the country, especially with Afghanistan, the country felt justified enough in the war that there was real talk of reopening the draft. Wow. People forget right. that, but there was. <clears throat> yeah, I was way, I was young. I was 15. Young child. Iraq started. Oh, stop. <clears throat> well, I might have even, did Iraq, Iraq started in 2003, right? Uh, Iraq's, Iraq started in 2003, yes. Afghanistan started in two thousand, late two thousand one, early two thousand two, and that that's the war that they would have gotten the draft initiated for was it's Afghanistan. In a certain way, the Iraq War almost saved us from the draft because it was a, the country was much more divided on it. Yeah, and I couldn't have been given given where in the way that I grew up, I couldn't have been a country subjector. I didn't become a country subjector to war uh, until I became a Christian, but I. Actively in, in the sense of studying it and all that, but um, it's always been a sticking point because we have just read, in a sense, the, rather you have just read the article that, <clears throat> uh, that gives Lutherans so much trouble because we are not a pacifist tradition. No, and it, I'm not sure that I'm a radical pacifist. In other words, I think I would agree that World War Two. <clears throat> was unfortunately necessary. Well, nothing will get me to say that it, that that uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were necessary, but in terms of Hitler had to be stopped. Yes, and the uh, the war against Japan cl- classifies under the traditional definition of a just war in that we were not the aggressor; we were attacked. Yeah, but even if even if you're attacked, I think. That doesn't mean you have to attack back. It doesn't mean being a, a doormat, but but I don't think it means you have to strike back. Fair enough. What I'm just I'm just telling you the classical, like Augustinian just war theory. Yeah, this is part of Augustine. I really can't stand. Maybe may, I haven't read it in Augustine himself. I assume it comes from the City of God. I think so. I'm look looking it up right now yeah i'm always positive because of the city of god and i actually haven't read that far in city of god i read a couple hundred pages of it for a course last year but we it was it was doctrinal stuff trinity and so on the as far as i like to call the important part yeah. uh, it wasn't about this this just war business and by the way i'm not convinced but i want to ask you about this Mm-hmm. I'm not convinced the Lutheran two kingdoms can even be saved. Hmm. Okay, so here are the... Thomas Aquinas addresses it in Summa, in his Summa Theologica. Yeah, he's Augustine plus Aristotle. I'm not surprised. So here's his, here's his three requirements, uh, okay. which, is, which, is, which is interesting because it, we run into problems with this in modern situations. First, just war must be waged by a properly instituted authority such as the state. Second... 
it must occur for a good and just purpose rather than for self-gain or as an exercise of power. So there goes the justification for this, this was clearly an exercise of power, what just happened. Yeah. And third, peace must be a central motive even in the midst of violence. Oh. Meaning you're fighting for peace, basically. That it's such a contradiction in terms. <laughs> right, but it means I, that you're not fighting for fighting's sake. Yeah, because that's so much better. <laughs> I know. I'm just. I'm just telling. I'm just. I'm just. I'm just giving you Aquinas. <laughs> it's not really doing much for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I'm just telling you. But to be fair, when Luther does all this junk. You know the the gallows man, the the what's a, the hangman? The hangman has a vocation from God. It's like, oh, shut up, Luther! Mm-hmm. I don't tell me that you know taking a person's life uh, uh, comes in the name of God. And if it does, then Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again for nothing. Mm-hmm. The scandalous part of that, though, is that it includes the people we don't like. Yep. I mean, my gosh, I was I watched all this stuff on all these serial killer documentaries. Did I tell you about that? Maybe we talked about it on the podcast. I can't remember. Maybe. I don't know. I love me a serial killer documentary. Oh, me too. I, I love that my brains just ooze right out my ears. In other words, it's what I watch to relax. Mm. <laughs> when I'm not watching Luke from Modern Family say, Die, pizza man, die. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, but but you know, it it includes the if if we really hold out hope that Jesus Christ is the hidden and revealed God, and is the one who justifies the victims for full humanity and puts the perpetrators to right. There's no death penalty. The death penalty cannot be just from a Christian perspective. Oh, I agree. And I, it, there's very good arguments against it, not just from, in, in terms of that, not just in terms of, uh, you know, thou shalt not kill kind of kind of thing, but it, it negates the possibility of reform and grace, right? So you, you have to say this person is irredeemable. And it, it's also, to be frank, found to be more expensive <laughs> Oh, yeah, with all the legal proceedings. But <clears throat> obviously Ted Bundy was, was guilty of what he did. There's there's no doubt. But in, in all these cases of people who are years later declared to be innocent. Yeah. I mean, you. <clears throat> it, it's an incredibly racist system. It is. That, it absolutely uh, is. That, that does, and you just want to say. It's, you, all it is is a catharsis. Catharsis for what? For society. <laughs> society saying, look, we've 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 dealt with this evil person and this is our cathartic <laughs> reaction to the evil they've committed. Well, and I have to be honest then about something. My first reaction when I watched the Bundy documentary was fry the sucker. Yeah. And believe me, I didn't say sucker. <laughs> well that's that's what I'm talking about in terms of that catharsis. That's the catharsis of the death penalty. But then I stopped myself and I said, why did I just say that? I call myself a Christian. I claim Jesus as Lord and God of creation, not just of humanity. And I just said, fry the sucker. I I don't know how you say that as a Christian. It's not about, uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm very anti-death penalty. I'm very anti-death penalty. But I understand why the death penalty appeals to people. Because it appeals to our need for revenge. Exactly. And in many ways, war does the same. But judgment is over. Judgment ended on Golgotha when Christ says it is finished. It's done. Mm -hmm. When are we going to realize this as humans? Never. We'll never fully realize it. It will never be fully realized in un, until the resurrection. The final resurrection. You mean. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But we proleptically have it now. I don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, it's it's interesting. I, I I claim to be so influenced by the Lutheran confessions that I'm arguing from Anabaptist lines at the moment. But mm-hmm. I think they're right about this. I, and uh, I think 
the the historic peace churches actually dr Moltman puts this beautifully in an article i can't remember the name of it but it's from 2016 the historic peace churches the unfinished reformation that's the name of, of the article the historic peace churches are the only ones who really took to heart luther's insistence on justification by faith alone mm. mm -hmm. and he wants, and I think he's right about this, by the way, he wants an amendment to the Augsburg Confession that says, and, you know, we, 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 we've got documents that say this on the, the ELCA website, for instance, but he wants it in the Lutheran Confessions. He wants a footnote mm -hmm. that says the condemnations of the Anabaptists in these documents do not apply to today's peace churches and he went further and said no lutheran candidate for ordination can be ordained on these documents unless this happens hmm. and i think he's it's ironic because he's not lutheran right but right. <laughs> but but i think i think he's absolutely right i don't see that footnote in my cold Wanger edition now, granted, when the Kolbwanger translation came out, uh, we hadn't achieved the reconciliation with the Mennonites yet. Right. But he he was getting a little, um, he he was he was getting very uh, radical about this point because it's a question of what do these documents mean for us now? And and you've got a whole group of Christians who take a vow to the Lutheran confessions. Mm -hmm. And they're condemning the Anabaptists all over the place, and these 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 folks actually took Luther seriously, mm -hmm. and Paul for that matter. Yeah, uh, but I've now given up my uh, Lutheran credentials when I say this. You know, mm. I don't I don't have any Lutheran credentials. I only have Lutheran degrees. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> I've. I've given them up in a way, but I've said this because I think, in this sense, um, Lutheran theology really erred. And mm. part of it is Luther himself, because his Theologia Crucis is not as radical as, as time goes on for him. Mm -hmm. The Theologia Crucis is radical from the standpoint of a young Luther. By 1525, it's very different. Yeah, it's and almost like he got scared of the... Of sort of the radicalness of his own teachings and and the impact they could have. Well, to look at it from a good Marxist lens, he sold out to the intelligentsia. They well, it became a state religion. Were... Well, but that was pretty much after his death it became a state religion. I'm saying the princes were the people protecting him. He was living as an outlaw for his whole life. Mm -hmm. Not his whole life, sorry, but from what is that, 1520, 1521, whatever that year is that I always mix up, uh, until his death, he was an outlaw. Mm -hmm. And so if you're talking about getting scared, <clears throat> I'm not sure how we'd prove that historically, but um, but I do think there may be something to be said about that. And, and you know, you get these, uh, the Augsburg Confession tries too hard uh, in some places, to be overly conciliatory, I think. Now, Luther did like the Augsburg Confession. I don't know if you remember that, but he, he praised it, and he mm -hmm. said that Melanchthon uh, could do it better than he could because he couldn't tread so softly, couldn't mm -hmm. tread so diplomatically. Mm -hmm. That's Melanchthon. But, uh, uh, but this is, you know... Condemned here are the Anabaptists who teach that none of the things indeed above is Christian. Would you ever stop to ask what it means as a Christian? Punish evildoers with the sword, which in the 20th century means fry them on the electric chair? Well, or um, more commonly is the chemical death penalty. More common, but only recently, right? I mean, in the past... 40 years, 50 years. The electric chair was never a primary form of it, it's, it's represented. It's a very graphic form of execution, but it's also a very expensive technical and time consuming method of execution. 
So, uh, um, so it's all about saving the money. It's not about the inherent dignity of the human person. Well, part of it's about <laughs> the inherent dignity of the human person because anyone who witnesses an electric execution, I mean, there are horror stories from uh, electrocutions, just absolute horror stories. Do you think there are any cases at all where the death penalty could be warranted? Any cases at all where the death penalty could be warranted? Yeah. <sighs> Let me think. It'd have to be for particularly heinous crimes for a person who was a risk to others and themselves. I mean, there have been people who have requested the death penalty in their guilty pleading. People who have said, I deserve to die. And so that always gets that always gets interesting. Yeah, but maybe in those cases, the greater punishment is not to die. Right. Well, I'm not trying to achieve the greater punishment. Yeah, but but, but I'm saying paradoxically. Yeah. Uh, the 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 greater punishment could be the gift. Hmm. I don't. I don't know. I think it'd have to be an extreme case, and someone who was an extreme danger. I mean, we're talking like supervillain levels. You know, yeah, I... especially especially because we can't just exile people to the Isle of Elba anymore. <laughs> Probably a good thing, right? If like so, if Napoleon, if exile had not been an option for Napoleon with the strong guard system that they had, if there were no way to get Napoleon out of France, then I could like maybe see it. I don't know. I really don't know. I like I. I'm hesitant to take so hard a line as to say it's never justified, but it's so incredibly yeah. rarely justified as to be like, you know, one person, one or two people in a generation. Yeah, I mean, I, I never know how to answer either because I have to just remain skeptical. Mm-hmm. But there are countries who have abolished the death penalty. I mean, what is the United States doing? <laughs> that we still have this arcane thing. And we even had a moratorium on the death penalty for a while. Please remind me what a moratorium is. It means that for, it was like two decades or something, no death penalties, ha- no executions happen in the United States. Oh, that'd be nice, but it was in like the, It was in like the 70s or something. Or 80s. Did you ever see Robin Williams' skit about the death penalty in Texas? No. Pro- I mean, probably, but I don't remember it. There's something like, you know, we're in Texas, we fry them for fun here. Yeah, basically. And, but, but I thought to myself, okay, the humor's amusing. I'm, I'm paraphrasing the humor, obviously. Right. But, but it's a larger question for me of why so many people get executed. And, and I, let's, but, but moving away from that sort of idealistic question, it's, it's another thing for me, nobody in the Democratic nominees that have been debating on the stage mm-hmm. is talking about anti-death penalty or is well, talking about reducing the wars. Well, They're all hawks in some way or form. Well, in some way. And some, some of that's just assumed, right? It's assumed that Democrats are generally anti-death penalty. It's assumed that, assumed that Democrats are generally anti-war. And right now we're talking about the differences between Democrats, so they're not going to talk about the things that they mostly have in common. Oh, okay, but but they but I still I mean it's just like they're not talking about abortion. Oh yeah, because we can all assume that or or LGBT rights for that matter. Well, right. they are a little bit, but but we can all just assume that they're all on the same page there. That's not part of the differences between them. We're not focusing on that right now. That will become more of a focus in the national election when, when, when there's a Democrat running against a Republican. Well, I mean, but to, to, to bring it back to the theological question, what do we do with this Article 16 of the Augsburg Confession? Well, I think we first we have to decide what being commanded to sin is. How about taking a life? I think in most situations that's a sin. Is serving in a war a sin? That's a really hard question that I don't have an answer to. I think it depends on the war. I don't have an answer to it either. I think, for me, a lot of this is very individual questions that I I can't answer universally. I can only answer for myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, It's a contextual question. Right, right. Because there are also people for whom serving in the military is their path 
out of poverty or out of a terrible situation. Yeah, what does that say? And so that's the lesser of two evils, you know, if you're viewing it that way. But we spend trillions of dollars on the military. Oh, absolutely. We spend more than at least the next 10 countries combined, maybe the next 20. There's no regulation. So to speak about this in Lutheran terms, there's no notion of, quote unquote, the just ordering of society. No. How is this just? Trillions of dollars on a, on a military thing. Um, I, I did want to ask you as well, it, if you think the Lutheran notion of the two kingdoms is salvageable. I would have to do more thinking on that. That was not a topic I was ready to cover today. <laughs> oh, I just sprang it on you. Boom. Sprang it on you. I want to say yes, but I'd really have to think on it. I'd really have to do some more digging and reading on it than I have. Was was the two kingdoms assumed at uh, when you were in seminary? I don't remember talking about it much, so it must have been. Oh, interesting. See, the two kingdoms tends to get very depoliticized. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it, it becomes, well, secular politics doesn't matter. And I think Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a very helpful uh, notion of this, and it's, it sort of seems obvious when you think about it, but in his ethics, <clears throat> in the essay Christ, Reality, and the Good, mm-hmm. he speaks of... Christ being present in the left-hand kingdom as well as the right-hand kingdom because the world belongs to Jesus Christ. Right, and I think that would have been the opinion you found mostly at Luther. So it's a Bartian Christological critique then. Right. Uh, that's ironic. Um, that that is, that is the position that I would give too, by the way, and it's why I think political theology matters because... Mm-hmm you're not going to encounter a situation where Jesus Christ is not there. This is Psalm 139, right? If I ascend into the heavens, you are there. If, if I make my bed <clears throat> in Sheol, you are there as well. Right. But, but that's a pretty actually controversial position for a lot of Lutherans. Well, at one, at one of the congregations I served at, we had a sending ceremony for an Air National Guard member who was being sent overseas. Uh, And at another one of my calls, we very much, I mean, the head usher was a police officer and there's a very strong sort of police history at that congregation. Multiple members were either related to or were form, you know, mostly related to police officers. Well, does police officers fit into what, I mean, I suppose it does with the, how do you say uh, this? The police officer thing gets really tricky. I yeah, I actually have more right now in the current context, in the current way things are being run. I think it's actually trickier for a Christian to be a police officer than to be a soldier. I don't disagree with you, but why do you hold that position? Because of the racism inherent in the system, because yep. of you know so many problems inherent in the policing system in the United States right now. I think it really, there are really major questions. And in fact, I am friends with a former chief of police who retired because he couldn't deal with it anymore. Well, he he couldn't handle the divide in his own life between being a good Christian and being a good police officer. Yeah. And and the system is at risk. And I I don't want to generalize, but the system is at risk. Of producing a state militia. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people who shoot first and ask questions later. I'm not saying that's every police officer, but I mean, come on, nobody. I don't think anybody believes that. No. But the but the overwhelming occurrences of this. I think I think the word that needs to happen here is reform. Uh, but the problem is. <laughs> You and I, doing this theologically, aren't really going to be taken seriously. No. No, it's not practical. Well, uh, yeah, it's not practical from that odd split between theory and practice from the Enlightenment. But um, it's it's not practical, and it's a, it's the larger question of what role does theological reflection have for society. Right. 
I think the liberation theologians and uh, in Germany, the political theologians, uh, have made the excellent case that theology is relevant. But my question is, is anybody listening? Mm-hmm. And I, I think the answer is, particularly in the anti-intellectual streams that we have going on in the United States right now, the answer is no. Do you where my pessimism comes through is I don't think the anti intellectualism in the United States is going to get better. No, I don't either. I mean, you look at the reaction to the Christianity Today article saying that Trump need you know that 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 Trump has gone too far. Oh, that was <clears throat> first of all that Christianity Today said that was hilarious, and second of all, uh, the responses were just like the Ku Klux Klan getting pitchforks. Well, and, and so many of them were anti-intellectual responses, right? Like, you know, oh, it's been influenced by the liberal intelligentsia. <laughs> well, I was just talking about the intelligentsia a second ago, so I'm no better. But that's, you know what I mean? That's... Yeah. Yeah, I do. I think we ought to do a part two of this conversation. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, when I am in better health, I I uh, <clears throat> am realizing that I was worse off. Some of it may have been the lovely cigar that I had, but <laughs> I think, but I think by and large, I I was perhaps more ill than I thought I was. Okay, but uh, so let's let, we'll pick this up in the next episode next week, and uh, until that time, I'm Brock Jennings and I'm Peter Clark. And this, even though we have criticism of the tradition, is your friendly neighborhood Lutheran theology podcast, Stumbling Block. Stumbling Block is a production of Silver Turkey Studios. Our Patreon producer is Ben Dittman, our executive producer is Peter Clark, and our executive director is Brock Jennings. Our theme music is by Mirrors for Windows, and we are hosted by Podbean. We can be reached by email at stumblingblockpodcast at gmail.com. Please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash stumblingblock. And as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>